Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Catch Space Virtual Meetup. How are you all doing? This is uh, Boss, a developer advocate at Couch Space. How are you doing, Atish? I'm doing great, Bas. How are you doing? Yeah, I'm doing well. We have a great program today. So, but before I'll get into that, let's yeah. we have a few public service announcements here. So, uh, we have a lot of new Couch Space Capella stuff going on. So, we have workshops that will be introduced. Uh, so we have one on the 26th of April and one on the 27th of April. Um, if you're interested in Couchbase Capella, I would strongly recommend uh, attending one of the two. Uh, we have a great uh, video uh, from one of our team members uh, on getting started in Capella as well, if you're, if your workshop is a bit much. And in case anyone has, uh, hasn't seen it yet, we have something called Playground, which is probably the easiest way to try Couchbase at the moment, so couchbase.live. And we have a very exciting uh, development here as well. We now have Couchbase Lite integration, in particular for .NET. And the final one, uh, we actually have a bit more social channels now. We're trying to be a bit cooler, I suppose, as a company. Uh, we actually have a Discord. <laughs> so if you want a bit more of an informal environment, um, and actually most of the developer advocates and some other technical members hang around there as well, just feel free to drop in, um, ask questions in one of the SDK channels, et cetera. Um, yeah, and Nitish will link uh, in the chat as well. So please have a look. Cool. All right, so for our agenda today, um, as a first speaker, we have JT. Uh, sadly, they won't be able to uh, attend, but they did pre-record a video. And we also ha have uh, Charlie later for another shell session. He will actually be able to uh, answer some of the questions for um, the new shell video. So please do think about questions, actually, because we will have some time uh, to answer those. All right, so a little bit about JT. So JT um, has worked on a lot of languages. So LFVM, Clang at Apple, uh, TypeScript and Microsoft. And after that, uh, Rust at Mozilla. And this is kind of what they've kept doing because now they've uh, actually uh, written their own shell, called New Shell, uh, implemented in Rust. And this is an extension of kind of the idea of Unix pipes and modern name programming languages uh, practices uh, as a structured shell. So I'm very excited to uh, yeah show this to everyone here. Thank you for inviting me to give a talk um, about New Shell, kind of a, a quick introduction to how it works. Before I get started, I just wanted to talk a little bit about some of the philosophy behind New Shell. New Shell is inspired by three really well-known projects. The first one is Bash, or Fish, <laughs> shells in general. Um, Bash is the first that comes to mind for a lot of folks, and Fish for um, the kind of more 90s crowd. <laughs> but uh, this idea of having a shell that you can interactively work with everything in your system, and it's really something that if you come from a Unix background, you really already know there's a ton of value in that. But what we wanted to do is kind of bring that kind of shell-based way of working cross-platform. So it works the same way in Windows and Linux and Mac OS, but really inspired by Bash and by Fish and shells like that. So that's our first inspiration. Our second inspiration is Python. This cool idea of something that feels pretty lightweight, but has a ton of additional functionality, especially when you dig deep. You can find mathematics libraries and science libraries, data frames, all kinds of stuff for doing data processing. And what we wanted in New Shell is something very similar. We wanted to be able to start with really small ideas and grow them up and have a language that really supports going from the small to the quite large. And finally, the last one is PowerShell. PowerShell is one of the only shells that actually took the idea of a shell, kind of the Unix pipeline idea, and extend it into something that's a little bit more structured. For PowerShell, that's object-oriented programming and objects 
for new shell, as we'll see here in a second, it's all about the pipelines and a universal form of data. Okay, so what in the world does that mean? So what I'm gonna do is just walk you through a couple examples of what it's like to use new shell. And my hope is as we go through the examples, it will kind of click. You'll get, you'll get that aha moment of why we went in this particular direction, why we took inspiration from these three projects and where we hope to go in the future. First thing I'm gonna do is type LS. LS for folks that are not familiar is gonna just list the entries in this directory. So you can see I've got a table, I've got a list of files and I've got sizes and end dates and whatnot. This table, it's not just a visual way of looking at these, you know, kind of a, a cute way of looking at the entries, but in fact is structured data. Each one of these rows is a set of data points that I can pull in. So if I wanted to, what I could do is take this LS and then do a certain kind of activity over this data. Uh, so here I'm going to do LS and say where size is greater than 10 kilobytes. So I've taken that whole data set, filtered it down to just the data set that I want, which is those two those two files that are of that particular size. I could do the same kind of thing with a different command. So here I'll say sort by size. And it's gonna go from small to large, you can see, all right? And this is all working on the structured data. To really kind of drive that idea home, let's take those same commands and use PS. PS is going to um, list out the processes that are running on my system. So here are all the, the processes on my system and I can do PS and then say sort by the memory that they use. You'll notice this memory column is now sorting from small to large. Now, if you're familiar with bash, I want you to take a second and see if you can remember how to do that in bash. Uh, one of the nice things about new shell is that if I have a source of data, I just have to remember a couple of filtering commands and I can do everything that I just did on any data source. And new shell not only has LS and PS, I could say uh, in this directory, I've got a TOML file. That's one of the data file formats that we support. So I can just say open cargo.toml. And in here we get a record, same thing. All that structured data is just presented to me and I can use the same kind of commands that I was using before. If I wanted to, I could say, get the dependencies out, see what their versions are. And then here, bit by bit, you can see I can build up a pipeline that gets really interesting data for me out of it. If say I'm a, an administrator and I wanna know, okay, in our project, have we at least a certain patch level for this particular dependency across all our projects, it's trivial to write a little script that goes into each, you know, each subdirectory, opens the file, grabs the dependency, and makes sure that it's over a certain, you know, certain version number. So really we wanted to take this idea of the pipeline and the structured pipeline, and then to make it composable. Here I'm using get, we saw sort and where, these are just commands again that you can use over any of our data sources. Let's do one last step with our dependencies. Let's say we wanna collect all the dependencies from all the projects that we work on. I'm gonna take this output, these the de set of dependencies right here, and I'm gonna save them into something called dependencies, if I can spell dependencies.json. We'll save into that file, okay? So I open the toml, grab the dependencies out, saved it as a JSON file. And then I'm gonna say open dependencies.json. You can see here is our JSON file created from the query that we just did. We can mix and match all the different file formats so we can work with JSON and TOML, XML, CSV files, you name it. We, there's a whole bunch of file formats that we support. Additionally, what we can do is go and fetch things from a URL. 
So there's a command called fetch. And here you can see um, me going and, and getting the new shell releases and then creating a, a JSON of all the releases. So if I can, you know, go look at that same idea, right? These are all the releases for a new shell. Or I can do a post, same idea, right? So we can post to some website, get the data back, and then start using it. Again, because we're working in structured data and we have pipelines that work on that structured data, all that composition just works. Let me show you something else. Um, in the current new shell, this is 0 0.60, uh, let me just open this, this uh, configuration file. So this is the current configuration file for new shell. And what you can see up here at the top is examples of what it looks like to create a function in new shell. Uh, we call these custom commands, but the same idea, right? I run this command with some parameters and it has input and output. And then so I can, I can connect this up to other things in the pipeline, and then it will act as one of the commands in that pipeline. So you can create, you know, functions out of the pipelines that you create. And there's modules. So here we've got some modules for completions. So new shell as a language is just as important as new shell as a shell. And I think as a user, that means that as I'm doing like interactive things in the shell and doing some pipelines, maybe I'm working with some data and getting it just how I want it. I don't want to lose that, right? I can easily turn that pipeline into something that I can reuse, put it into a module somewhere and make that something that, you know, two weeks from now, I can go grab that module, grab the import and keep working using those same pipelines that I already spent time building up. We really want it to be such that, you know, you grow again from that very small to the very large. As we were talking about with Python, you can, you know, grow up to those, those larger applications. I used to work on the TypeScript programming language. New Shell takes a lot of the inspiration uh, for that. So you, we can do completions. Uh, so for example, if I say open, I hit tab, it's going to say, oh, there's a file path that should go here. And it gives me completions on that file path. If I say dash dash, you can see there's a list of flags. It tells me what the flags are and a little bit of help text that go along with each one. And these completions work um, in various other ways too. So if I say get checkout and then hit tab, you'll see all of the branches for my, my git. And these kind of completions that we're seeing here, these custom completions can be created by anybody. And we're starting to get a collection of ones that are created by, you know, just contributors to new shell. I'll, I'll mention this really quickly, uh, as a, as a cool little aside, there's an area of new shell that will be continuing to evolve and that is data frames. So I can, um, I can hit DFR and hit tab. You can see a whole bunch of commands that are intended to be data frame commands. Once we get this to where we want it, the idea of having data frames as just part of the language and part of the engine mean that users will be able to easily take a script that they've written. And if their data source is really large, like a really large CSV file, they'll be able to open it up in the data frame part of the system do all the manipulation that they need to do. And of course, using the, the data frame engine, it can be extremely fast. So we're really excited about this part. And there's a whole bunch of features that we want to add, but I just wanted to mention it really quickly. And that's it. That's kind of new shell in a nutshell. The, um, the latest release was 0 0.60. It's a complete rewrite of a whole bunch of parts of the system. And it is really ready to grow from being a cool proof of concept. So now we're on the path to being like industrial strength programming language and shell. Thanks so much for having me on. Um, if you try out new shell, feel free to send me a tweet. I'm at J N T R N R and let me know what you think. And, uh, I will see you all online somewhere.
<laughs> Bye, everyone. Cool. Thank you, everyone. I hope everyone really enjoyed the talk about New Shell from JT. Um, as JT said, feel free to also ask him questions directly uh, using his Twitter. And we also have Charlie here now to handle any questions, if anyone has any. Hi, Charlie. Hi. Hi. So Charlie is um, also in couch space, one of the SDK engineers, probably working on the GoLive SDK. Yep. Cool. So since we're, Charlie, since you're going to talk a bit more about shells anyway, can you tell me a bit more so if you want to learn more about new shell when it comes from, like, say, Bash background? Yeah. So the new shell website is really helpful. And they have stuff like um, coming from Bash or coming from new shell, stuff like that. They actually have little kind of guides. I'll drop link somewhere <laughs> cool. uh, yeah so they have guides that you can look at and it kind of tells you so this is how you do this in bash this is how you do it in new shell which is really useful because sometimes it's just you, you just don't know what to do so you just go and look at that and yeah it's great cool I'll have a look thank you so much sorry so yeah we have another shell talk now uh, not the new shell but the couch base shell uh, yeah, take it away, Charlie. Okay, I'm just going to share my screen. Uh, there we go. Is that working? Yeah. yeah, we can see something that looks like a shell. So that's uh, all good, I think. All right, well, let's get going then. Okay, so yeah, I'm Charlie. I'm a member of the SDK team at Couchbase. And uh, thanks to JT for that great introduction to New Shell, which sets me up quite nicely for talking about Catchbase Shell. And hopefully, I'll also be reinforcing some of the things that he said about New Shell. So, Catchbase Shell is built on top of New Shell. So, we get all the kind of modernization and features of New Shell and we sprinkle some couch-based functionality on top. Uh, some of you may have seen talks about couch-based shell before, or even played it, um, but hopefully I'll cover enough stuff here that will still be new and interesting for everyone. So if we start, we're gonna start by looking at our current environment. So if we run the CBN command, we can see that any, this is basically the set of defaults that we'll be running against when we run commands. So that means when we run a command, it'll run against the dev.local cluster and the default bucket. If we had a scope or collection set, it would run against that scope and that collection as well. And the administrator just tells us the current user that's being used, which is registered against this cluster. So in Couchbase shell, things like, well, clusters need to be registered with the shell in the config file so that the shell knows how to interact with that cluster. That is the host name, uh, credentials, that sort of stuff. When it comes to the bucket scope and collection, you can change these to whatever you like and they'll only get used when a command is actually run. So to illustrate that, if I try and change to a cluster that doesn't work, something like meh, it won't let me because that doesn't exist. But oop, uses the old version. If I was to change to use bucket not default, even though that's not registered and it doesn't even really exist in my cluster, it will let me do that. But let's change back before I forget and break it again. So we can change back to the default cluster. So as well as clusters having been part of the environment, there's also this flag here, Capella. 
and what this tells us is a little bit about the Capella environment we're using. So we can actually register multiple Capella organizations with the shell, but as with the cluster, only one can be active at a time. We can override these cluster, default clusters and Capella organizations on a per command basis using flags. And I'll show you that a bit in a bit. So here we can see my Capella organization is my Capella org. The default project is my Capella project and the default cloud is Charlie Capella. Now, you probably won't need to care about the default cloud at all. This is specific to NVPC clusters, which I'm just using in this demo, just because it's convenient and we'll cover why in a minute but that's probably something you don't need to worry about and don't need to ever populate. So let's start working against Capella. What we're gonna do is we're gonna create a cluster and we're gonna use this definition, which we'll look at in just a second. You'll note that I'm using the VPC environment. By default, this would create against close hosted, but if you're not familiar with how to interact with Capella when it comes to things like managing buckets and users and clusters. They don't use the same API as a standalone Couchbase server would. Say if you had it running on your Mac or your PC or whatever. Instead, for security reasons, there's something called the control plane API, which is what all of these management commands like users go against. And right now, the hosted version of that API isn't quite fully feature complete. So I'm gonna use the MPC, MVPC version just so that I can demonstrate a few things which you will be able to use soon against close hosted. So if I run this command, what this is gonna do is it's gonna go off and tell Capella to start deploying a cluster. Let's take a look at what this looks like. So this is what my definition looks like. It's going to create a cluster with the name CB shell. It's going to have three nodes and then these search query data and index service on each node. There's a bit of information about the AWS instances it will use, which again, because well, I'm not sure if that will be there. Never mind. Uh, the support package which is specific to Couchbase, and then the version of the cluster, which is just latest. So if we then take a look at clusters, this is going to list all of the clusters that are currently running on our Capella organization, the active one. So we can see I've actually got three clusters. And the hosted shell doesn't have a cloud ID because that is a hosted cluster. So let's take a look at the cluster that I just create, created. And we can see that it is currently deploying. And um, looks fine. But we don't really want to wait for that to deploy because we got better things to do. So here's one I made earlier. Now, I deployed this cluster, but I haven't actually done anything with it. So that means that if I try and actually interact with it, it won't work because I haven't registered a user and that sort of stuff with it. And the other thing that we need to bear in mind is that if we look at the registered clusters for this shell session, it's not in there either. So hosted shell is in there, but shell demo isn't. And here we can see the set of clusters that we have registered. So we could run commands against and you'll also notice that the hosted shell one has the mycapella org registered against it. So what we need to do is we need to register this capella cluster with our shell session. And we can see that register takes the identifier to use, host names, username, password, and then a few optional bits that we can use. So let's take a look at what we're gonna to pass to this. So we're gonna register this cluster with the name shell demo. We're gonna use this SRV record, which we got from here. 
we're then going to create, well, not create, we won't be creating, we'll register it to use the username Charlie. This password is register with the default bucket of Couchbase Cloud Bucket. And we're also going to register it with the Capella organization of my Capella org so that the shell knows how to talk to it. So now that we've registered that, we can switch our cluster to this new one, which is shell demo. And you'll now note that the prompt has changed. I've now got Charlie as my user, the shell demo cluster, and the Couchbase Cloud bucket. So if I now run doc get key, this command is going to fail because I haven't set up a user. And within Couchbase Capella, there's a security feature called allow lists. And allow lists are basically a whitelist of the addresses that are allowed to connect to that cluster. And at the moment, that allow list for this cluster is empty. So even if I create the user, I still won't be able to connect in this machine because it's not in the whitelist. So there we go. Yeah, we can see it's failed to connect to the cluster and it's just telling us a few things to check. So let's start by actually registering an allow list. As we can see, yep, there are none there. So let's add my IP and let's hope that my ISP has not changed it in the last half hour. Okay. And then if we take another look, we can see that it has added my address permanently against the cluster. Let's move on to registering the user. Again, there are no users. So we need to create one. If we look at the upsert command, we can see we're going to need a username, the roles for the user. And because we're creating it, we're also going to need to pass in the password. So what we need to do is create a user that matches the username I already registered with the shell, the same password. And I'm also going to give myself data writer permissions on everything. So once that completes, we can run users again and see that I now have a user registered. So now I should be able to interact with this server. So if I run a doc upsert, then we can see it succeeded. And I can then get that data back. And there we go. That matches what we passed in. So we're done with that now because we're going to use a hosted cluster for the next bit. So what we can do is tell the Capella to destroy that cluster. We will change our environment default to dev local. And then we can unregister this shell demo from our shell session. So we won't be able to use it anymore. And that's just gone. But if we do clusters get a shell demo, because we're running against Capella, it doesn't need to be registered. But we can see that it is in the destroying state. So hopefully, even though I had to use an MVPC cluster for the time being, hopefully this shows you how simple it is to spin up a cluster, create the necessary resources that you need, and then burn it back down. So you can easily use that if you want to run automated tests and you want to automatically set up the system, or just in general dev, if you just need a system to just throw up really quick and run some commands against. It's, it's pretty simple to do so. So let's move on to looking at actually migrating some resources like scopes and collections from our local environment to a Capella cluster. So I can currently see that in my local environment, I just have this one bucket. And that's not a very interesting bucket. So I'm going to load the travel sample sample bucket. And then if I run buckets again, we can see that's now loaded and I can use it. So I'm going to change my default bucket to travel sample just because it makes it a lot easier 
when we come to run the commands. And within this travel sample bucket, we can see that I have these scopes and collections. However, if I run these commands against this hosted shell, I can see that I don't have these. That all that's registered on there is the underscore default ones, which come with the bucket. So what I want to do is I want to take all these scopes here and all these collections here, and I want to move them to Capella. So to move the scopes, I'm going to run the scopes command. I'm going to select the scopes column to restrict the table just down to that single column. I'm going to filter it so that there's no underscore default because these already exist. And then for each of these scopes, I'm going to run the scopes create command. And I'm going to pull out the scope from that column. And I'm going to run it against the hosted shell cluster. So when I run that, and then I'm going to do something very similar with collections. I'm going to run the collections command. I'm going to again filter it. And then for each collection, I'm going to run collections create for the collection. But I'm going to run it against this scope, which we can see it will be this collection, this scope for each one. And again, run it against the hosted shell. So if I run that, I can see that that apparently succeeded. To then confirm it, if I run that, and again, the collections dash dash there, we can see that I've successfully migrated my scopes and collections from my local cluster to my Capella cluster. Now, in the same sort of idea, I'm going to run query indexes. Now, this gives me a big table of all of the query indexes in my active cluster. But if I run it with the ooh, dash dash definitions flag, I also get well, I also get these these definitions, which is the nickel for creating that index. And just to show this a bit better, I'm going to limit it to the definitions column so that we can see what it looks like it's called definition so there we go the nickel looks like this and um, we can use this in a very similar vein to what we've already done we're going to run query indexes definitions we're going to limit it to the travel sample bucket we're going to get the definition and then for each one we're just going to run query with that nickel against the hosted shell. And you'll note that across the scopes, collections, and query indexes, I've used a variety of different commands here, like get, select. When I ran the collections, I didn't bother with any of them. I'm just trying to illustrate that there are lots of different ways of interacting with these with the data. And you can kind of pick and choose as you want or as your data dictates. So let's take a look at the query indexes on the hosted shell. And we can now see that I've migrated all of my query indexes from local to remote. And it was pretty easy to do so. Now, if you're running a test environment, chances are you probably don't want to be migrating from your local cluster to your remote cluster. You probably want to be doing something more repeatable. So we can save these scopes down into this JSON file, which, as you expect, just looks like this. And then once we've done this, we can take these scopes and, again, limit them, and then for each one, create one. And this time, I'm going to use this build string command to pull out the scope and then put the suffix underscore well, dash second, just because otherwise we'll get errors because the scopes already exist. So if I run that, and then again, I take a look at my scopes, we can see that I've now also created these from a file. So we can also do this with analytics data sets, data verses, all that kind of stuff. And what I'm kind of trying to illustrate here is to kind of back up JT's 
point, what he, what they said, was that it doesn't matter where we get this data from. We can get it from the file, from the cluster itself, from wherever. It's, once it's in there, it's in there, and we can just use the same sort of commands and pipelines against any sort of data we want, really. So let's move on. And while we're still on scopes, I want to just illustrate something else. So here we can see we're doing the same thing again, but now I'm running against this dev.star as my clusters. Now clusters takes a regular expression, which means that if you recall, I had two clusters. I had dev.local and dev.remote. And if I run this command, then what it's gonna do is it's gonna create scopes on both of those clusters at the same time. So I can verify that by running this, and we can see that I now have these dash second scopes on both of my clusters, which I think is quite powerful, being able to run commands against a variety of clusters at once, pull in the data, manipulate the data, save it back out, so you could run things like health checks and go across all your cluster and then push it into another cluster, that sort of thing. Let's now take a look at actually interacting with data as we've done a lot of kind of resource migration. I'm going to change back to the default bucket and I'm now going to introduce this fake command. So what fake does is it takes a terror templating file and it just uses the template to create some fake data for us. Now, if we take a look at the template I used to generate this. So here we can see that the body of our, well, Countspace shell, when it comes to upsert, requires a specific format of just having an ID and a content column, where the content is the document body and the ID is the document key. So here for the key, I'm just going to use a UID. And then for the document body, I'm going to create something that looks like a user using these functions. And I've also got these order values where I've just kind of tried to simulate a list of values which correspond to like um, the value of an order of each of the orders that a user made. So let's also just take a look at the sort of, uh, what's, there we go, list functions. We'll take a look at what actual functions we have available. So we got quite a few here. So we can actually generate some reasonable fake test data. Now it's a bit cumbersome to be typing that whole fake dash dash template thing every time. So what we can do is we can alias this command to fakes. And then if I run fakes, we can see we get 10 users each time I run it. But we can do better than that. We can create a function which takes a num parameter and it will then run the fake command but it will create the number of rows that we specify. So if we then run this with say seven, I get seven users and that, that that's a bit better. And at this point, I also want to just briefly touch on errors inside of Nusha. So as you can see that they're really quite useful. Like it's telling me exactly what's wrong. I'm missing a positional, Tell, even tells me the name of what it is and how to use it. And in general, new shell errors are really helpful and try to actually tell you what you've done wrong and how to fix it. So anyway, let, let's make some users and we're going to upsert them into the cluster. We're going to also add this is faked column and we're going to set the value to true just so that if there's any data already in that bucket, I can limit what I, I, I can I'm adding a way that I can get that data back by filtering. So there we can see we've successfully added 10. So if we then want to 
get the order values for these users back we can do that with a query except first we need a primary index which luckily we can quite easily uh, create from the shell on the no on default and then that will create our primary index which apparently is going to take a second or two and then if we run this again we got the order values and if we flatten that out because each value is a list we can see we get this big thing of order values because we see there's 10 users so we've got lots of different values now with this we can then pipe it into something a bit more complicated like we can run the same query again we can then flatten out the order values by just getting that column flattening it and then we can run this inbuilt new shell reduce function and what we can see then is the total value of all of the order values that all of our users have made so you could use this for something like working out the total amount that users have spent for any given day or something like that so moving on to something else we can also see here we can select the ids for all of these users we've just created and then we can pipe these ids into dot get and so here we can easily get all of our users over kv which is a bit more performant than getting the whole body through query but we could easily really easily do that just by using these pipes and on a related note we should take a look at scripts so here's a script that i've written or my colleague has written and what this is going to do is it's going to run the buckets command it's going to pull out the names and assign them into this bucket names variable and then it's going to create this alias which is going to take each of the bucket names it's going to run this bucket configs command for each one buckets config is quite a low level command that gets kind of a bunch of information about the bucket and then it's going to pull out basic stats and then create a table of just ops per sec and then we'll be able to actually run this and we'll see how many operations per second each bucket is doing. So in order to do that, we need to create some data. And when we're actually creating data using fake, it's generally fake itself that actually takes the time to run, not the upsert. So we're just gonna save it down to a CSV file, just because as you can see, fake is a bit slow. And then what we can do is we can open fake oh, oh, users and dock up certain so there we've observed a thousand users and again and again and again so then hopefully when we run our script we'll actually get something out of it and there we go we can see the default bucket is undergoing 400 operations per second so I think next, what we need to look at is our config. If we look in the .cbsh directory, the two files in here that matter are config and credentials. I'll explain credentials in a minute, but config looks like this. So here we can see I've got three clusters registered. You may recognize dev local, dev remote, boosted shell. And it's got things like the host names, credentials, defaults that it will run against, and registering the Capella organization here that it will be using, and then timeouts and stuff like that. So here we can see I've also registered a Capella organization, and this identifier matches the one for the cluster, as well as setting up the default project and the default cloud that I mentioned earlier that you probably won't ever need the credentials file is why there are no capella organizations 
require to interact with them, you have to set up an API key. And so here you can see I don't have any information about an API key. That's because I've moved that information to a corresponding entry in the credentials file. And I could easily have done the same with any of my clusters. I could have removed the username and password and put them in that credentials file. And what this means is you can check the config file into source control without leaking your credentials. Or you can do something like I am here, where I'm sharing my config file, but I'm not sharing the credentials, so they don't get leaked at all. New Shell has a whole heap more commands that you can play with, and there really are quite a lot of them. And if you wanted to look at the Couchbase specific ones, you can just run aware and see that we also have quite a few specific ones. The final thing that I wanted to touch on is something that I've shown people previously, and they've kind of gone, ah, that, that was something I was wondering about. Like that made something click. And that is, how do you use commands that are native to new shell with new shell and make it so that you can interact with that data? So if we take git log as an example, and we're going to output it in a pretty format of the she slash slash committer slash slash the script well, summary slash slash date time of the commit. And as you can see, new shell doesn't know what to do with this. But there are a bunch of built in commands in new shell, which can help us to make sense of this data. So the first thing we're going to do is pipe it into lines. And then for each line in that git log, we've got a table in a row. We can then take this and pipe it into split, which will then take each of these slashes and do a split on it. And then for each corresponding entry, make a column out of it. So here we've now got the Shea one, the committer description, most that. And then I can filter it by commits that are just me. So you can kind of see how you can take data and new shell gives you these different ways of then kind of passing or interacting with that data. And that's actually about all that I've got. So thank you for attending. And if you've got any questions, I'd be more than happy to answer them. Cool, thank you so much, Charlie. I'll just wait a minute or so to see if anyone has any questions. All right, I'll have one for now. So you tried a lot of functionality and you've kind of like started to talk a bit about some of the automation you could do. Could you tell me a bit more about like taking a step back, like what kind of like things could you do as a user? Like, I mean, testing is obviously one, could you name a few like use cases which someone might want to use this for? Yeah, so things like automated testing where you can spin up your cluster create a bunch of resources on it, stick data into it, and then run your tests. It's useful for if you, well, two different development in kind of two different streams, well, the same stream, I guess. But so you can do things like you can easily set up a repeatable dev environment, which matches prod, because production, you're probably not going to be creating resources where you've migrated them from local. They'll all be done from file. So you can easily create that re reproducible replica of production, which is short. They just need to spin it up, do a bit of dev against it, destroy it. And kind of relatedly is the ability to just really quickly spin up a cluster and then just play with it however you want kind of thing. Just quickly run some commands, see how something works, see what something looks like and get rid of it.
the one supposedly slightly mean question as well. Well, maybe you know it. So, uh, having it like you showed the error messages in New Shell, which were quite impressive. You know whether this relies on on Rust as a type system or whether this was actually used uh, done using New Shell uh, error messages. I'm kind of curious what it leverages. Um, I'm not sure what it leverages under the hood, but I'm pretty sure it's it's using new shell specific stuff i think <laughs> like obviously the error messages seem to be very rust kind of influenced yeah that, that's why i ask because like i know rust is really strong in error messaging so yeah it's, uh, it's, it's the, the rust compiler gives you errors where there's an error in your code and it tells you how to fix it before you've even had to go and look up how to fix it <laughs> exactly <It's> exactly <laughs> Cool. Well, thank you so much, Charlie. It's a great presentation. Uh, Couchbase Shell. I think we don't have any questions in the channel. So, yeah, I, I would say thank you so much, everyone, for their time. Um, like we said before, there were a few announcements in case you've missed them. Um, we have Couchbase Discord, a new Capella tutorial, Capella workshops. Please have a look in the links we've uh, put in before and yeah thank you so much yeah, for everyone's time and thank you charlie thank you for having me